And the first verse I looked at was right here in Revelation 22, 17. It says, whosoever will. Don't you like that one? Whosoever will. If you're breathing, you qualify. You don't have to show us your resume. You don't have to give us any of your background information. The thief on the cross next to Jesus did not have a lot of time left to live. And yet he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Showing us that we should not overcomplicate this thing. And that if we, I really feel the strong leading of the Lord to say, I can offer you ministries to work with that we've vetted and that we trust, that we know and that we're supporting to make it easier for you than just going out and finding your own thing. But you're not restricted to just use the ones that we're talking about. But those are the people that are on the front lines. And life is difficult. So it's not like you have all this free time, but sometimes it's just an hour or two and, you know, we say it over and over again, the people that serve are just as blessed as the ones who are receiving the food at the food pantry. You go there, and because you're extending yourself on behalf of the poor, which is what the Lord said, that's right in the Bible, because you're doing what he did, he came down, and he extended himself on our behalf, so now we are operating in that opposite spirit of the world. We're being generous when we don't have to be. We're being generous to people who don't quote unquote deserve it. They didn't earn the right. Well, neither did we. That's why the eternal justice of Jesus has to have forgiveness. There's no cancel culture in the kingdom of God. <laughs> All right? I'm not going to use a lot of phrases in, that are in the culture today, but I'm sure glad there wasn't a cancel culture because I would have been kept out of the kingdom of God. He accepted me. And out of my gratitude, I want to serve him the rest of my life because I don't think I'd still be alive if I hadn't gotten saved. So I'm going to ask Carolyn if she'll come up now. And uh, I'm just, I want you to understand a little bit more about her role in the ministry that we help support that she founded, but also that she's an elder here in our church, as was Lisa Melillo, who spoke earlier. And Lisa's on the board of uh, First Choice. So you know, we're talking to people who are very involved in the ministries that we're supporting. And in this case, in Carolyn's case, the founder of the ministry that we're supporting, which is called the Family Success Center, but it's called the New Destiny Family Success Center, which I love. That's a very inspired name that you gave. So, uh, that the Lord gave you. Sorry. Let me give you this microphone and say hi to Carolyn McCombs. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor. Um, you know, as, as Pastor was sharing, even though I am, you know, the founder of a ministry, God keeps up in the, the, the level of commitment. So yesterday I had the experience of going to the office. This is a long story. I don't even want to talk about it. But we were supposed to talk We yesterday. were supposed to talk. So the first email said, I'm, I'm going to be busy until 2. <laughs> then I'm going to be busy till 5.30. And this is turning into a bigger project than I thought. I said, don't worry. Holy Spirit will take it. So I arrived at my office it's somewhere around 4.30 in the afternoon. This is downtown Patterson. Um, we've had an issue of homeless people sleeping. And the group keeps changing. And so this time... The group of people who are sleeping outside our doors are different from the people who slept outside our doors three or four months ago. So when I walk up, I've had the occasion to walk up, and every time I walk up, I feel like the compassion of Jesus comes on me. I walked up about two months ago, and there was a young woman there. She looked like she could be my daughter. And from what I've heard, she's been very violent. She's come after people with knives. And immediately when I saw her, I said, sweetie, how are you? She says, I'm okay. I said, I have to come into my office. I said, do you mind? Oh, no, no problem. I said, honey, I see you put stickers all over our window. Would you please take those off? She said, no problem. And she took every single sticker off. And I just felt like the Lord is getting my heart ready to begin to meet people where they are. Yeah, amen. And yesterday I walked up again and it was an older woman sitting um, at, the, at the door. And I said, hello, how are you? She said, I'm, I'm okay. I said, I'm sorry, I, I have to get into the office. Do you mind? She said, not at all. 
And she stood up, and when she stood up, a quarter dropped on the ground. And I felt like the Lord stopped me in the moment, but I was so distracted. I had so much going on, I couldn't grasp what the Lord was probably asking me to say or do. And I'm just like, you know, she picked up her quarter and I was like, thank you very much, I went in. So this morning I'm in prayer and the Lord brought me to the Bible where um, Peter and, um, I, think, I think it was Peter and John, um, were walking by and there was a, the person that was begging alms. And when they walked by, he asked them for alms and they said, look, we don't have silver and gold. And they said, but look at us. <laughs> and I thought about what you just said, Pat. look at us. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Right. And that man received his miracle. And I feel so much like that's where we are as a body of Christ. God is saying, I am your eyes. He says, look at the lonely, look at the lost, look at the homeless. Say, look at me. Look them in the eye. Just like um, um, Mr. Hutchins is doing. And say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And I believe that's the boldness that's coming on us in this hour as we begin to trust God and seek him for what it is he's, he's calling us to do. Amen. Right. No, stay. That's just good. Um, so, look, most of us probably are not asking people to move away from the front of the door when we go in to work in the morning, okay? So this was a voluntary thing that Carolyn knew the Lord was showing her to do. And it's not exactly the safest place, right? And, you know, the, we had one intern that was working there for a while. I think it was the first day she was on the job. There was a shooting a block away. Okay, like, you know, it's not every day, thankfully, but wouldn't you think it would take a lot of courage to be able to do that when Carolyn had a, a background of being an executive, she has an MBA, she, you know, working in, in big corporations, and yet there's a calling that comes on us to say, no, I know what God told me to do, and I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to pray for the people that come around and support me, but my eye is on the prize of what he asked me to do. And he asked me to name it New Destiny. Like, if that's not a Jesus justice thing, what is? Right? You're going to have a new destiny. Every time I say the name of the ministry, I'm reminding myself that God has a new destiny for me. And it's a family success center. So the things that the people that are near this ministry or need the ministry are being taught tools to know how a healthy family should function. Anybody here want to volunteer for that? Well, we did have guys go in. Yeah. And, uh, and the and, fatherhood uh, initiative. The fatherhood initiative, yeah, where yeah. men from our Corey, church went down Corey and Jones. spoke. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, and and just to that point, Pastor. Even now, more we need men who are fathers to mentor men who have never seen a model of what father is. And um, the other day, I had an, a conversation with someone in the state of New Jersey, he's in an office in the state. And I said, yeah, you know, I have this vision to bring a fatherhood program to our city. And I said, I got some seed money for it. And I told him how much I got. He's like, oh, no, no, no. He said, no, 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 no. You need way more money than that. <laughs> You're like, yes. And, yes. <laughs> but what I know is men need men to model how to be fathers. Right. If you've never seen a father, how would you know? But as we, as uh, a people of God, model the father, we lead them to the father, right. who is the ultimate father. Right. So let me just say the justice of the eternal justice of Jesus is a little different than what we've been hearing about so much in the news is because we're not even talking about politics now. We're just talking about a need that's here. And we're the church. And we had a need, and we came into the church, and people opened their arms and received us and helped us. I hope that's true for all of you, Amen. right? But in the broken state we were in, somebody looked at us and said, God loves you, even though you didn't even feel lovable yourself. And now, like, to just stand before the Lord one day and say, you live during one of the biggest crises in, in, in the country's history. People are out of work. The economy's disrupted. And who's being left behind are the most vulnerable people. They don't have the bandwidth at home. They don't have the laptop. They can't do Zoom calls. They don't even know how to use a computer to do a Zoom call. Something that we take so for granted that we 
we joke around that somebody froze a little bit because they didn't have a strong enough connection. I go to work, I have eight screens around me. And they're all being used. And I'm thinking like, what the heck happened? Like this is, this is almost required on everybody's job now to be so technical, technically savvy. And if, and, you know, because I was on the board of Carolyn's ministry, I got to learn a lot more about it than most people probably would. And I won't go into detail uh, or disclose anything confidential, but I was not aware of how difficult it is for an inner city child who doesn't have both parents in the house to keep even with other students in, in the school. Because here's one that I just had never thought about. During the summers, both of my parents were home. I had a great family. I was supported in the things that I wanted to do. And we spent summers together and we would do things. We'd go on vacation together. And I was actually growing over the summer through my experiences. Carolyn would say to me, oh no, our kids are falling further behind during the summer. So because they're not using what they were taught in school and they're basically just idle during the whole three summer months, they come back to school and they forgot a lot of what they already learned. So now the other kids didn't, the other kids were being supported and now the, the gap just keeps getting bigger. I'm not talking about political solutions now because we could disagree all day long about what's the right way to solve the problem. What I am saying is we can't say we're not gonna try to help the problem. We have to do something, right? Like that's the urgency that we have that we, we're going to stand before him someday, and, and he's going to say there was all these needs, like, right at your door, and all you did was keep having, you know, church services. I love church services. I hope you're glad about that. But that's a piece of what we do as we serve the Lord, right? But we should really be encouraging one another and spurring one another on. I love that expression, right? That's a New Testament quote, that we spur one another on to good works, not because we're earning our salvation by good works. It's so... That's a juvenile way of looking at that whole topic, right? We didn't earn our way in, but now that we're in, there should be a fire shut up in our bones to want to share with the world this good thing that the Lord did for us. And maybe you're not the greatest street evangelist, but anybody can take cans of food and put them in a bag. You don't have to know Romans chapter 8 for that one. 